Good afternoon. So Lucas and I are very excited to be here today to tell you a bit about what we've been doing with Datomic and to walk you through some of the features that we've found useful. And hopefully you find them useful and interesting as well. So to start out, I guess we should maybe answer the question, why? Why, why would we build a bank from scratch in Brazil? And why would we choose Closure and Datomic to do it? I mean, is that even safe, right? That, that, maybe that doesn't seem like a great idea. But uh, the answer is kind of that, that somebody had to do it. Um, <laughs> if, you, if, if, if you look at what a bank was historically, it was a very place-oriented thing. There's big marble buildings. There's huge branch networks. It's extremely expensive to make one of these things. Um, you know, it's, it's not for you as, a, as an entrepreneur. Um, today, a bank is more like a mobile application connected to a database with a bunch of gnarly integrations on the back, and, the, and, and that's a bank, right? So um, the world kind of changed, and it's not clear that the existing banks are actually going to make that transition, right? That sounds more like a software company. Uh, and that's what we're trying to build, is a software company whereby instead of selling our software, we actually use what we build to make the best and most sophisticated bank that we can make. Everything from user experience and design to machine learning for underwriting and fraud monitoring um, to you know, just producing the feature velocity that we expect from tech companies rather than uh, you know, what we've grown accustomed to from, from banks. Um, and so this, this kind of wave of technology change is making a lot of banks around the world, not just in Brazil, uh, uncomfortable, right? Because you know, it's not clear that a legacy base of COBOL duct taped together from decades of mergers and acquisitions, it's not clear that that's the ideal platform to build a bank today, which, which is, is frankly a mass consumer technology product um, and, and service. And so really the goal was to sit down. We actually didn't know about hammocks back then. We, we used chairs, and we sat down with a blank piece of paper and said, what is the ideal platform for a bank if we were going to make a bank now? E even if that sounds crazy, what, what do we need, and, and, and what do we want to build? And that led us on a research project that initially brought us to Datomic, ironically, and then Datomic brought us to Clojure. Um, and that's become the, the core and the, the foundation of of what we're building in Brazil. So I'd like to tell you a bit about that. Um, this is the Datomic logo. I guess the one thing that the banks today have going for them um, is there's a lot of barriers to entry in the financial industry. The barriers are very high. It's very hard to climb over them. We're intending to do exactly that. But if you're going to do something hard and there's lots of large and scary competitors, um, it's nice to have some kind of a super secret power, super, super power, something like that. And so Datomic is, is, is kind of part of that story for us. Um, obviously, this logo is designed to be a stylized version of an alien spaceship, right? And, and Datomic's totally an alien spaceship in many ways. It's, it's not that much like the databases that you know. Um, that can be good. It can also be bad. Uh, it's, it it's kind of takes longer to ramp. It's kind of harder to reason about initially until you kind of get you, you kind of get a feel for it. So we're going to talk a little bit about Datomic, and let's go, let's go deeper here. Um, so the first superpower is probably the most obvious. This is audit trail, right? You're going to make a new system of record. Um, you need to know what happened. You can't lose information. You need to know everything that happened, right? So that's actually a lot of work. Um, let's go through a series of events, a normal series of, of events for, for a new bank. Um, and, and I think the, uh, the power of Datomic will become a little clearer. So a customer joins the waiting list to get a credit card from Nubank. Then one of our robots approves them for a 3,000 reais credit limit, which is the Brazilian currency. After that, the customer makes a MasterCard purchase at Starbucks. A customer support agent increases the credit limit for this customer to 5,000. And later on, the customer blocks their card uh, to prevent fraudulent use. So pretty mundane series of events, but this is, this is pretty normal for us. Let's look at how Datomic looks at this same sequence of events. So 
we've seen already today this, the, this kind of structure in Datomic, actually the, the talk right before lunch. Um, but each one of these events that happens is really a database transaction, and that transaction places facts, datoms, into Datomic, and Datomic tracks facts over time. So the concept of time here is native to Datomic. Um, and in some cases, like in the, the changing credit limit and the, the active to blocked status of the card, you would traditionally mutate data in, in your Postgres database to do this, right? And in the process of doing that, you might lose something. Um, in the context of Datomic, you don't do that. So Datomic models this as retract 3,000 and assert 5,000. It doesn't mean that there was never a credit limit of 3,000 on this account. It just means that now the credit limit is 5,000. Um, here we can see the basic structure of a datum is entity, attribute, and value. And this theme, this kind of EAV, and then there's a transaction. Uh, EAVT will become clear. That's, that will kind of echo throughout the presentation. So basically, what you see here through all these steps, it, it's, it's basically Git. Now, the, the, abstract, the, kind of, the metaphor is not perfect, but in many ways, it's Git. And, you know, Git is very popular, we all use it. We don't use it because it's so simple and easy to understand, we use it because it's powerful, right? And it, it, it helps us, and, and it helps us in, in very specific ways. Uh, we don't lose data. You're never gonna lose code that, that you committed to source control, right? And you're never gonna lose the, the versions of that code. Um, at the same time, you're gonna know what changed when, who changed it. You're gonna be able to look at things like, what was it as of a certain point in time, or, or what happened since the last time we, you know, we looked at this. And, and finally, you can even do things like forking. So you could do speculative things with, with your repository, and maybe that works out for you, maybe it doesn't, right? So thinking about that in the context of a database is, is kind of interesting. So coming back to our, the business, you know, it's very common to get questions like, like this. Um, happens to us all the day, and this is not banking specific, but you know, what was the initial limit on the card? So, okay, yeah, we could track that. We can make audit tables. We can track that separately. Um, but the questions keep coming, right? At, at the time that Starbucks transaction happened, what fraud triggers would have run if we're back testing kind of new fraud robots? You know, what would have happened? You have to reconstruct exactly the state of the world at that time in order to answer that question, right? So it's getting harder with a traditional database. How long did the customer spend on each stage of our acquisition funnel as we kind of move them along to becoming an actual, uh, an actual card holder? Um, well, we forgot to store those fields, right? We forgot to store the timestamps of every, every transition. Um, but we have the timestamps of every attribute that was written to Datomic, and we can actually answer this question based on what, what, what the, the timestamps in the database. Um, how frequently do we see amounts changing on transactions that come from Starbucks, right? Every time that amount changes, and these transactions are not as immutable as you'd like to think, they change a lot, and when they change, we retract something, assert something new, and you have the history of that happening. So we can answer this question generally. Um, and this is all Datomic out of the box. We haven't done any work to do this. This, this you get for free. Um, we did a little bit of work to extend it. So questions like, what sequence of events led to this piece of data being written into the database? Um, and, and as an example, maybe it was the iOS client made an HTTP request. That led to a Kafka message being published to, to a topic, and then another service read that Kafka message and wrote something to Datomic, right? So this may give you a series of correlation IDs, um, and that's interesting, right? You, you don't necessarily want to lose that. You can compare that to your log stash, and you can see exactly the entire kind of forensic history of how that data came to be in your database. Another one, who's responsible for the credit limit increase, right? In this case, it might have been an administrator that, that did the credit limit increase, in which case it'd be nice to know that it was Lucas that put that through, right? This is basic financial audit trail. Why was the customer's card blocked, right? Was there, was there a reason behind that? You know, you could, you, you could store this, but maybe you, you end up polluting your domain model with a bunch of extra metadata uh, storing it this way. So let's look at how we can do this in Datomic. So this is a function block card. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna transact a new fact, which is this line here. We're gonna make the card status blocked. But we're actually gonna add to that a transaction, and we can attach 
really interesting metadata to the transaction itself, the database transaction itself. And that allows you to go query that out. It's just data like any other data. And we can query that out later uh, to reconstruct exactly why this happened. And you keep that completely separate from, from your domain model, uh, which stays clean. So that's pretty interesting. Um, the way to think about that is that each of these commits, you actually have tags. And those tags can contain arbitrary metadata about those transactions. And if you're not doing this, you're, you're actually losing data uh, today. Then later on, when you want to know who blocked the card, you have the same, this is a query now, but you have the same structure here, entity, attribute, value, and transaction. Um, and so in this one, we're going to query when the card status changed to blocked, we're going to figure out what transaction happened, and then we're going to get the metadata associated with that transaction and traverse that to get the user CID and tags. So that's an example of how you can treat the transaction as a first class entity, attach metadata to it, and query that back out. Uh, so uh, knowing what happened uh, before uh, in the past for the database is very good. It's very good for out audit trail. But it's also so good for a bank, but for most companies, not to let bad, thing, bad things happen to the database. So authorization is a big requirement. Security is a big, big requirement when you're building some software. So the second superpower is how, how do we handle authorization in the Atomic? Uh, basically, the customer tries to access some resource, some URI uh, on, on, on our system. For example, the comments of a purchase. And I need to know if I let this happen or not. We need to know if the customer is allowed to see the comments of the, this purchase. And to do this, we need to trace back the customer, the, the comment that the user is trying to see until the customer uh, that owns that, that comment. Uh, and one way to do this uh, is we can write a query that traverse, traverses this graph of, the, uh, of relationships. Uh, so we get a purchase ID, for example, and we need to know uh, if the customer owns it by getting the purchase ID and seeing which account it belongs to and see which customer belo uh, this account belongs to and then see if the, the customer is the customer uh, that, that's doing the request. Uh, this, we could, could do this for all entities, but it's a, a little bit hard to do this for a, a, a little bit too much work to do this for all entities. But with Atomic, we can write one thing called rule that's basically a way to do a logical war in the Atomic that looks like this. We define uh, uh, a rule here that has a signature just like closure functions. So I, I'm defining the owns function, the owns rule that receives a customer ID and an entity. And the ground rule is the customer owns the, the, this entity. Well, if the entity is the customer itself, so the customer owns this entity. Uh, but we can continue. So defining the same rule again is another way of matching this rule. Uh, so if I have an entity and some attribute that references other entity and the customer owns that entity, so it means that the customer also owns the, the first entity. So we're building here a, a recursive rule that, 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 that decides if the customer owns or not this, this entity. And when we use it on the query, we just need to pass the rules to the query and use it as it was a function on our, on our system, on our, on our query. And with this, with this much code, we can solve the ownership uh, for all entities of our system. And we can answer the question shown, the question if the customer can or cannot see some data. Uh, and it's pretty good, but uh, can we go further than this? Uh, at Nubank, we 
we let people on the first week starting at the company push code, to in, push code into production. So, uh, and it, it, it's for everybody, not just for senior engineers, for juniors, for interns. Everybody is allowed to push code into production on the first week. And what can we do to prevent someone who just started to write a query that returns all the purchase in the system to, to somebody, right? It's, it's, it's very easy to forget one of the bindings and return way more data than, than you should. Uh, so in order to, to, to solve this, uh, I'm going to go back to, to the ONS function. Uh, and here, I'm binding the entity here. So I'm giving a customer and an entity, and I want to see if the customer owns this entity. But Datomic runs with uh, using an engine, uh, a language called Datalog, that is a logical uh, language. So if I don't bind the entity, it will simply find all the entities that match this rule. So I didn't bind the entity, and I wrote written a, a function that it's very similar to the, 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 the other one that simply returns me, to me all the entities that the customer owns, okay? Another thing to, to notice about Datomic is that the database is passed to the query. So the database itself is a value. It's a value that we can use and receive to, 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 make, uh, to make queries. And what, it, what does it mean? Uh, back to the Git analogy, when you check out some code, you have a snapshot of the code as it were at some point in time. Uh, if somebody else changes the code and push into to the remote repository, your code in your machine doesn't change at all. It's a snapshot of some point in time. And for the time, and Datomic is the same. This database is a snapshot of the, 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 the database itself at certain point in time. So it's immutable and it stays there and it's a value so we can manipulate this value. One thing that we can do with this database is, is to filter it. Uh, so if I get all the unowned entities for this customer, uh, I can use the filter function on the atomic, and this filter function receives a predicate that receive, receives the datum. So we can see if this, this datum could be returned or, or not based on this predicate. predicate. Uh, and this datum is entity attribute value transaction. It's the same thing. Uh, we store something and we query the same thing and we can filter by the same structure. Uh, and we are filtering by, well, if this datum is from one entity that the customer owns, so I'm returning it. So what this function does, does is it will return a database that simply don't, doesn't contain any entity that the customer can't see. So it's a database with everything. With only uh, only things that the, the 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 customer can see. So if I write some query, for example, get all the purchase of some account, uh, I can either pass the full database or this filter database if I want to get to get extra safe. Okay, uh, and this way we simply can't write a, uh, uh, a query that will return more data than the customer is allow allowed to see, okay? Uh, one thing to point is, like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't write a query that relies on that fact, okay? So this query up there doesn't rely that I'm only seeing uh, customer uh, authorized datums, but I can choose to, to only pass to, to it a, a database who has a filter, a, a, a smaller set of datums. And 
it's obviously faster to pass the full database. So uh, it has some performance impact, but it's, it's a price that maybe you're willing to pay if you want to be really safe and if you want to really know that nobody can re simply re re write a query that will destroy the image of your com company, okay? <laughs> so it's a good price. So, so s safety is good uh, for, for a bank, but at the same time, we're also a mobile application, right? And so expectations of customers, the bar's pretty high. They don't want us consuming their whole monthly bandwidth, especially not in Brazil. Um, so we'll talk a bit about some performance and, and specifically bandwidth performance considerations where Datomic can help as well. So one next thing is HTTP cache. We, when, when communicating with the, the mobile phones, we use HTTP REST API. So one cool thing to use is the native HTTP cache. So one way to use it is when we return some response to, to, to the client, we return it with a, a header less modified uh, with the date when the, this data was less modified. Uh, and on the next uh, request for the same uh, URL, uh, you can pass this date, and if, it not, if nothing changes, you can simply return 304. So you're not consuming the whole bandwidth for, for this client, okay? Uh, it's a cache me mechanism, but in order for it to work, we need to keep track of the last modified date. That's basically one of the two most, most hard problems in, in computer science. So how do we handle cache? How do we invalidate cache? So what is one good date for use on the net less modified? Well, one question, one answer is low. Less time of any entity that this customer owns changed, okay? If something about that customer changed, so I'm returning this, this date and I don't want to, I, I don't need to do uh, a, a, a complicate, a complex logic to know if that entity touches or not my, my response. And how do we write this query? We can begin with the same rule as we saw before. So I take one on the entity uh, and I'm basically here, I get a transaction that changes anything about this entity, okay? And on this transaction, I want to know which time it happened, okay? So the Atomic already stored it for any transaction you do on the database. And you simply get the maximum time any transaction that touched any entity that the customer owns, okay? So with this function, we, we simply solve the way uh, we generate this header and we validate this header. No need to know anything about the entities themselves, okay? Uh, and, well, that said, uh, we, we are very good for cache hits this way, but sometimes I made another purchase. I make another purchase, and the cache the cache blows up. So what do we do when there are cache misses? So the next superpower is mobile sync. So if if my my iOS app already saw a purchase for a month ago uh, and it didn't change at all, why send it? again to the, to, to the phone, okay? So I, what I really want is to only send back the changes, the purchases or the, anything that changes to, to the mobile phone. So on our API, when we return this list of purchases, for example, we also include a hypermedia link to get the updates of this list. And on this link, uh, we pass the query parameter with the less well, with, with the date that if I start there and from beyond that uh, I will get the updates of this purchase. Uh, so 
How do we implement this is, well, if I want to get all the updated purchases, I pass the database in an instant, or uh, the, 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 the time when I, get, I got the, the last response, and I use it on the query using this things function on the atomic. It simply, it simply filters the database to contain only the datums after this time, okay? So it forgets all about the past and only gets the datums after this point in time. This is not sufficient. We also need to get the historical database. This, the database uh, uh, usually only contains the true facts now. With the, the, the historical database, we can also get the, the, the facts that were once, in a while, once back true. It can contain facts that are no longer true also. If for, so if I removed some, some fact from, from the database, the history database will still contain this. So we pass this new database as a parameter on, on, on the query. So uh, besides the full database, I'm also pa passing this filtered database that only contains the updates since the time I'm giving it. And if the entity I'm wanting to, uh, I'm willing to, to return is included on that database, it means that it changed. So I don't, want, I don't need to do any fancy thing to, to answer this question. I just check if any fact about it changed since a, cert, a certain point in time. Um, and well, these was, were, were the, the four superpowers that we wanted to talk about to you, but we, are, we have a little bit more time, so I'm gonna continue adding more superpowers. Uh, so the fifth superpower is future DBs. So we, we can go back in time in the atomic and see well, how was the database back then, but we can also move forward, forward in time using the, the atomic. Uh, what does it, what does it, does it mean? For our, our business, when I make a, when I made a I make a purchase, uh, not everything about it is a fact yet. Well, it can change. It can change amount, it can change something. I can purchase something that I will only pay next month or, or something like that. So I can get this purchase and generate all the possible charges this, this purchase will have. So I'm projecting charges that don't exist and they are not a fact yet. I'm creating a projected view of th these charges. And using the with function of the atomic, uh, uh, this works just like a transaction, but it doesn't save the data. Instead, it returns to you a database value of with these new facts I'm trying to add. And if I simply add these values using this with function, I can get a database that contains these virtual charges. Uh, and this so fact, uh, I, I actually did this code last month, and it made me remove a lot of code from 10 different places that were handling virtual charges and the possible things that I want to charge the user just generating a, transact, uh, a database with these future, char uh, future uh, char charges. Another superpower is testing. Uh, so if I continue, I can still get a virtual database for my, my tests. In this case, I want a set of entities that I want to test against it, and I create a database containing these entities, okay? A virtual database, uh, and simply passing this database to the query. So this way, my database is local scoped. It's just as it was a local variable on my system. I don't need to care about cleaning up databases, 
uh, doing transaction, not committing transaction, or anything like that. The, I'm just passing a value that contains this, this, this facts, and this value will die as soon as the local variable scope die. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and also, the database itself is a collection of facts. So a valid database value, value is a collection of facts, of datums. So if I'm testing at some weird query, I can simply produce all the datums are relevant for this query that I want to test and pass to it and test something fun. Another thing that's kind of interesting with Datomic is that the schema itself is data. So you transact the schema into Datomic, and that's how you can do structural migrations, um, schema migrations, but you can also extend it. So we, we found a use case whereby we wanted to add a new bank specific attribute to the schema, which is, in this case, the customer's name is personally identifying information. That means we need to encrypt it at rest. Um, so what we can do is actually install that into Datomic as an attribute of this um, of the customer name. And then we hook into that. Whenever we store something, a uh, customer name in Datomic, we actually render that into ciphertext and store it as ciphertext. And then when we pull it back out, we render it back into plain text. So this is completely transparent to the engineers working with the code. We install it here, and we hook some functions on it around the, the, the query, and we solve that problem centrally. So that's, that's something that you would, you, you would struggle to extend a, a traditional database. Um, another feature, and this is, this is a feature because it's a non-feature, because you don't need to do this, um, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, today, this is just a, a handful of our services. Um, but conceptually, they're all using the same transactor today. This is a cost optimization. There's actually no relationship between these services. There's no dependencies between them at a database level. But they all go through the same transactor. They're all writing to the same DynamoDB table uh, backing Datomic. Um, in the future, obviously, we'll move to this model uh, as, as, as volumes kind of warrant the extra cost of running more high availability transactors. So we'll have one transactor and one Dynamo table per service. Going further, we'll shard a single service, right? So we'll have our customer service with perhaps a canary shard where we deploy things first for the first 10,000 customers, and then subsequent shards, right? And there's, a, there's many operational reasons why you would want to do that. Um, database performance, thankfully, is not one of them. So with this sharding approach, what we do get with Datomic is we get a shard-specific peer cache. So Datomic works by farming out the processor load to the peer, which is why it's not called a, a client, I guess, is the peer actually pays for the cost of doing its queries. Um, and, it, and it is mainly limited by the scalability of DynamoDB. So on, on, on that, we feel, we feel just fine. At the same time, so, so, so what this means with the peer cache is you have a hot set in memory, and it's going to fit in memory for that peer, and it's going to be specific to that shard of customers. So you'll get good performance from that. At the same time, when you have a feature like one we're building now, which is instant peer-to-peer -peer transfers between customers that may exist in different shards, you can just do an ACID transaction in Datomic. You don't have to take that out and do a two-phase commit or something complex, a complex workaround. Um, if you had sharded right through your database, you'd have to do that, right? And, and the database itself is, is one of the main drivers of, of this kind of sharding in, in, in many other types of systems. So the, the feature here is that there's no feature, and, and you don't have to do that which is nice. Um, another superpower is database aggregation. So if you look at architecture, it's a standard service-oriented architecture, which is really good operationally. That's what you want, typically. Um, but for data science, that's, that's a nightmare, actually. You spend all your time just trying to kind of put all, all, all the, the pieces back together and get the whole, the whole picture, right? So with Datomic, you actually can give data science a read-only API whereby they can do a query that queries multiple databases or all the databases and joins all that data back up um, using their own CPU and not competing with production for, for, for that load. Um, the, the way you do this in Datomic is simply passing in the databases that you want into the query, 
lining them up, them up in the end clause, and then querying the specific database where the data exists. And you can, you can do those joins across service boundaries, across, you know, across everything, and, uh, and, and it just works. And you'll get that, that full picture of the data back together. The other thing that is really helpful for data science is you know, it's very important that you don't use information that you wouldn't know at that point in time, right? So actually knowing when things happened uh, you know, and not the last modified on, on, on the row, but, but literally each fact, when did we know it, that's kind of a killer feature for, for the machine learning guys. Um, so that's, that's what we have on the datomic superpowers. I think we're not arguing necessarily that you can't solve these problems in other systems. People solve these problems every day. Uh, I think what we've been pleased with is finding that the kind of cost to benefit and, and the engineering leverage we get from using Datomic to solve these problems has allowed us to not spend very much time here and, and actually to move on to things that are domain specific uh, and, and Brazil specific. So in a sense, Datomic has, has allowed us to take, take shortcuts. Um, as a final note, uh, we're hiring, we're building a closure team uh, in Brazil, open to remote, and if anybody's interested in either the, the mission of building a new bank, using Clojure, using Datomic, um, come find us, talk to us. Uh, we, we'd love to chat about that. Um, this is Rio. We actually work here in Sao Paulo, so that's a little bit misleading, but uh, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a paradise, I promise you. So. That's, uh, that's all we have. We have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any questions. Thanks. <laughs> the, the question was, do we take our system down for 12 hours a week like a regular bank? No, we, we actually never take our system down. So we're already running high availability on every service, including high availability on the Datomic Transactor. Um, and we've tested this, and we've actually tested it pretty, pretty hard. But the, the, the transactor failover is on the order of five to seven seconds, and then you carry on, right? So, so you have the, the kind of acid properties, which is nice. You have the single right bottleneck, which is irrelevant for our business, because that's not, you know, we're a very read-heavy workload. Um, and, and kind of the world carries on, and you, you, you remain consistent, and you remain up. And also, we deploy like several times a day, so it can't go down. <laughs> Which is why Lucas is worried about the interns writing bad queries, because <laughs> it, it, it moves pretty fast. Sure. So the question is, how do we deal with replication? How do we make sure our data is stored in multiple places? And, and, and how do we deal with the complexity around that? The answer is we don't do that at all. We, we completely avoid that. Um, we use DynamoDB as our storage for Datomic. There are other storages. Uh, our, our, our feeling right now is that you know, we're not going to be better than Amazon at running a distributed database. DynamoDB stores data in multiple places, like a kind of a fast S3. Um, and we outsource that, right? And, and again, it's, it's all about trying to focus on the things that are going to make us unique and not, you know, r running a React cluster that, that we're going we're gonna to mess up. So I don't have specific numbers. It's not, it's not large. So we're not doing massive write volume. We have relatively well-structured data. We have transactions, payments, things like that, bills. Um, it's on the order of a gigabyte, I think, a gig, a gig or two of data at this point. Um, it's not growing really fast. It's pretty space efficient as well, the, the, the datomic storage. No, so, so, so the idea behind the sharding is actually to not do it. So we, we will make sure customer traffic ends up in the right shard. Uh, we'll kind of dispatch 
on customer vintage, let's say, make sure they end up in the right shard. Um, but actually, you know, how do we maintain that hot set, that kind of hot cache in Datomic that's correct for that shard is completely transparent to us. So it will pull the data when it needs it. It will serve the data from cache if, if, if it doesn't. And it will garbage collect that cache as it needs to, right? So if... So, so, so they're actually not. We, the, all, all of these shards are different EC2 instances, um, but, but they'll talk to the same transactor, and that will be backed by the same Dynamo table. So, so we're not actually proposing any, any kind of fancy, fancy sharding for Datomic. I think the, the, the point was kind of the opposite, that, that you don't need that, or you, you're not going to need that. Um, Thank you. I think that's, that's it. So thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much.